right? So um, in order to study a planet, Earth, which is, right, the study of geology is a study of Earth, um, we kind of need a planet to study. And uh, that means we need a solar system for that planet to exist in, and we need a universe for that solar system to exist in. And there's probably a galaxy in there too, probably. Um, but anyway, uh, let's talk about basically where Earth, um, Earth's origins. How about that? And so we're going to step all the way back to something called cosmology. And this is a study of the origin and development of the universe. So we're trying to see where the universe um, comes from. So the origin of the universe is described in what's called the Big Bang, which occurred about 13.7 billion years ago. And I could do like a cheesy song right now, but that's okay. Um, the idea of the Big Bang was developed by Georges Lemaitre, who was a Belgian mathematician and priest who worked on this, these ideas of the Big Bang in the uh, first half of the 20th century. And what he said was that all matter was packed into this tiny, tiny point that expanded. So the Big Bang isn't really an explosion like Bang suggests. It's more an expansion. And as the universe expanded, uh, hydrogen and helium formed. Those are the original atoms that, uh, that existed. The heavier elements, the things like the carbon and the sodium and the oxygen and all that stuff, are formed later by fusion in stars. And what fusion is, it's where two atoms get together and become one. And when that happens, energy is released. So, for example, in our star, uh, hydrogen is fusing together to make helium and creating uh, the energy in the form of heat and light that we see. All right, but being scientists, of course, we need evidence for this. It can't just be, well, this seems like a good idea. You know, you need evidence to back up that this expansion occurred. And some of the evidence is the movement of galaxies. And this was first noticed by um, Edwin Hubble, uh, the guy the Hubble Space Telescope's named after. And he was looking at galaxies uh, in, uh, like the, I think it was the late 20s, early 30s. And he noticed, because of something called the Doppler effect, that um, all of the galaxies are like moving away from Earth, which would make sense if everything's expanding. And so uh, this is called the expanding universe. And if you're interested in this kind of stuff, um, I'm not going to talk much about it in this class. Uh, you should take an astronomy class. You'll learn a lot more about it in, uh, in astronomy. So anyway, there's this movement of galaxies that we see that the universe is actually expanding. Then there's this stuff called the cosmic microwave background radiation, um, which um, basically imagine this, if everything was packed in a tiny point that was really, really hot and it started expanding, we have that same amount of heat in a much bigger area. Um, this is like that residual leftover heat from that initial expansion. Uh, that's a, a way to look at that. And uh, it's everywhere in the universe. Uh, it's like uh, someone once described it as the afterglow of formation. Um, so it's this leftover background radiation, no matter where you look, there it is. And it was interesting how it was discovered. Back in the 40s, people calculated that it should exist. And then when uh, we started getting the use of uh, radio telescopes, um, people noticed there was a lot of static in the radio telescopes. And um, it ended up that that static was this background radiation. And in fact, a few people won a Nobel Prize for uh, showing that this stuff exists and exists all over the universe. That's how important it is to understanding the formation of our universe. And then there's the abundance of elements. So astronomers and astrophysicists have told me that when you look at the abundance of elements that are found, it makes sense for the universe to be about 13.7 billion years old with these stars existing that are forming these different elements in them. And like I said, you want to know more about this, take an astronomy class. All right, so now we have, um, we have a universe. 
Now we need a solar system for our planet to exist in. And the way our solar system began is explained in what's known as the nebular theory. And in, um, and in this, we start with a nebula. Not that nebula. She's kind of scary and I think she could kick my ass. So what, this kind of nebula is what we need. Okay, so what a nebula is, it's this cloud of gas and dust that's out there in space somewhere. And uh, this is a nebula, um, it's uh, actually it's part of a nebula called the Eagle Nebula, and this is a uh, Hubble Space Telescope image. So what happens in the nebular theory? Um, we have our cloud of gas and dust out in space, and it starts contracting under the force of gravity. Because what gravity is, it's actually an attraction force between two different objects. Every object in the universe, as long as it has mass, has gravity. And um, in fact, if you're really bored, look up Newton's Universal Law of Gravitation and you can figure out how much gravity you exert between like you and your loved ones uh, when you stand a meter away from each other. I did this once. I was really bored. Um, but anyway, all these little particles, they have some mass, right? And so they're going to have some gravity, and so they're going to get attracted to each other. So this cloud starts getting pulled together under the force of gravity. And this nebula kind of contracts into this spinning disk. And this dust and gases continue to hit each other in that spinning disk. And when they hit each other, they stick together. And so they, these particles start getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, most of the mass goes to the center of, the, of this rotating disk, and it starts getting really, really hot there. So, in here, close to that really hot center, we start having all kinds of different um, rocky material accumulating. Rocky material like this stuff, right? It's going to be things that have a high melting point like iron and silicate minerals and feldspars and stuff like that. Why does, do those tend to accumulate towards the center? Because they're stable where it's hotter. So we start getting these kind of rocky um, bits and pieces sticking together in the center because it's hotter and they are stable there. Out towards the edges, way out here, we start having gas-rich um, materials accumulating. So you have ices of uh, water and ammonia and methane and, and stuff like that accumulating out there. And why do they accumulate there? Because they are stable at the lower temperatures away from the center. And this is why, ultimately, we have two different types of planets. We have the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, which are all made out of these like silicate minerals and, and rocky stuff. And then we have the Jovian planets, or the gas giants, like uh, Jupiter, Neptune, Saturn, and Uranus, which are all very uh, gassy because they're farther from the sun where it's colder, and those gases are um, uh, stable there. All right, so all these, these pieces start accumulating, get, hitting each other, getting bigger and bigger and bigger, ultimately forming our planets. Fusion is going to begin in the sun, and when fusion begins, that becomes a star. And so now we have a solar system with all of our planets orbiting it, and because um, I, I miss Pluto, I picked a slightly older diagram that still has Pluto on it, because I miss Pluto as a planet. All right, so now we have a solar system. But what specifically was happening with Earth at this time? Well, Earth began as this irregular homogeneous mass. So all these pieces of this rocky material hit and stuck together. And um, irregular means it wasn't spherical. And homogeneous means the composition was exactly the same, whether you were out here at the edge of the planet or here in the center of the planet. But it gets hot, and heat makes this molten. And when Earth is molten, everything's tugged towards the center, so the planet gets shaped roughly into a sphere. Yes, I know it's not a perfect sphere, but it's close enough for government work. And so it gets shaped into a sphere by gravity. And since it's molten, 
differentiation can occur. And differentiation is where heavy stuff sinks to the middle of the planet and the lighter stuff floats to the outside of the planet. And that's why today on Earth we have this core that's made of heavy materials like nickel and iron and we have this lightweight crust that forms the outside because that's all the lightweight stuff that floated to the outside. And then the middle part, this, this part in between the core and the crust is called the mantle and it's kind of in between. It's not as heavy as the core, it's not as light as the crust. And that's differentiation where these different materials kind of separated and the dense stuff went to the center and the light stuff went to the edges. But early on in Earth history, this happens. A Mars-sized object hit the planet. And this significantly changed Earth. So what we're seeing here, here's our Mars-sized object. It hits the planet. And um, this, it says, propelled a, a bunch of debris into orbit around Earth. And so just like a meteorite that would hit today is going to kick up a bunch of debris, now imagine a planet-sized meteorite hits. It's going to hit, and it's going to throw up a whole bunch of debris, both from the impactor and from Earth itself, and this stuff goes into orbit around the planet. And so for just a little while in Earth's history, we actually had a ring, kind of like Saturn. But in addition to putting all this debris in orbit around the planet, it also tilted Earth's orbit to about 23 degrees. Uh, and it also sped up Earth's uh, rotation. And uh, so if you look at a globe today, you always see Earth kind of kinked over. It's because of this impact that occurred. Now eventually, that debris that was in orbit around uh, Earth coalesced, it came together, and formed our moon. And so now we have a planet um, with a moon that looks pretty much like our um, modern Earth. And uh, we are going to spend the rest of the semester learning about how that planet works. Now one thing about uh, my lectures is that um, I finish all of them with something I call the random picture of the day that probably has nothing to do with, uh, with geology. And uh, it's just because I like sharing other things that I do. And uh, these days, one of my main research interests is geoarchaeology, where I look at how humans and the planet have interacted over time. So I've uh, visited a number of different archaeological sites. And this is one near where I used to live in Germany, and uh, it's called Zanten. This was a Roman colony in the uh, first century AD, actually first and second centuries AD. Um, they uh, had a bathhouse and an amphitheater and lots of different houses and temples and things. And it was uh, quite a large city on the frontier of Rome. Because it's right along the, uh, near the edge of the empire, which at the time was the Rhine River. And in any case, this is the amphitheater that's uh, being restored there. Um, this is wintertime. You can see the dusting of snow. In summertime, they have concerts there, and they like reenact gladiator battles without you know, the death. And uh, when they're not doing stuff like that, you can actually go in there and climb around on that, and you can stand in the center of it and yell at your friends things like, are you not entertained, and do fun stuff in there. And uh, so if you ever are in this part of Germany, I highly recommend going and visiting Sanden.